Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arseblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Thank you for being here as always. We are slap bang in the middle of an interlull. Uh, so there's not been a great deal going on from an Arsenal perspective this week. The most exciting slash interesting thing from an Arsenal point of view is the return to the club of Jack Wilshire. He's not going to sign for us or anything like that. I think Mikel Arteta made it quite clear that that's not going to happen. But he is doing some training with us, getting his fitness up. He's doing his coaching badges. The club are helping him in that regard. And that's nice. I think that's cool. He's obviously had a a difficult period. He was trying desperately to find a club towards the end of the transfer window. And it really didn't pan out for him. And when you consider he's only 29 years of age, that is... I guess a huge disappointment for him. He feels like he's still got something to offer, but there aren't really any clubs out there who feel the same way, it seems. Maybe in January, who knows, but perhaps this is the start of a a new era in Jack's career with coaching and uh, everything else. So uh, that's nice. I just think it's nice when we uh, bring players back and look after a guy who... You know, when it comes right down to it, he picked up all those injuries uh, playing in an Arsenal shirt, doing his best for the team. So if we can give a bit back, then why the hell not? Beyond that, not a huge amount happening. There haven't been any internationals. We don't know exactly what's going on with our players who are away. I think the first games are this weekend. And then, of course, there's some games in midweek. We don't play again until... Monday week, so we do have an extra little bit of an advantage when it comes to the post interlull games because, you know, we have those extra couple of days over the weekend. It's not going to be much fun as there's a whole weekend of Premier League football being played out without Arsenal, but fingers crossed we can reap the benefits of that um, when the time comes. That's down the road a little bit. Today on the show, in a moment, I'm going to be talking to Clive Palmer about what's going on with the Newcastle takeover and the wider implications for football and a bit of Arsenal stuff as well. Later on, I'll be talking to Dave Seeger, who many of you will know as part of Gunnerstown. He's uh, written a new book called Arsenal for Everyone. So we're going to talk to him about that, the circumstances of that book and uh, what it's all about. So uh, stick with us for that. But like I said, my first guest today, we're going to get straight on with the show. Minimal, minimal waffle today. My first guest, you'll know him from the Arsenal Vision podcast and more. It's Clive Palmer. Hi, Clive. Yeah, hello. How are you doing? I'm all right, thank you. I, we we got to start by talking about the Newcastle thing, the Newcastle United takeover by a Saudi, a Saudi Arabian investment company who apparently have nothing to do with Saudi Arabia at all, but we don't believe that. Well, I certainly don't believe that, uh, despite some assurances given to the Premier League. And it's opened up a very interesting discussion about the ownership about, um, you know, obviously there are there are issues with this Saudi regime. There's the murder of the journalist in recent times. Uh, all, all of that kind of stuff has led to a lot of... Um, I think what's interesting about this to me anyway is that there appears to be more than any other takeover in the past. There's been a real focus on Newcastle fans and how they should object to this and how they should somehow come together to to oppose it, to to ensure that it doesn't happen in a way that it definitely didn't before with Man City, with PSG, with Chelsea. I know times are different, but I think there's something quite interesting about this and the way that, that this has been framed as something that that is the responsibility of Newcastle fans. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't be uh, objecting to this. Some of them will, some of them won't. But the way that football has been run over the last number of years, basically the only way you can be competitive is to have a billionaire, an oligarch, a nation state, take over your club and spend all the money. So this is really a consequence of of what's happened in football. And I kind of feel that it's a bit unfair to to put this on Newcastle fans as a whole without looking at the wider context. Yeah, football's done this to itself, hasn't it? Yeah. It's, it's created the landscape where this is the only way you can survive. And so many years ago, we may have been saying, I remember when, when Roman came in, mm. we were saying originally, oh, well, we, we, we don't want that. We don't want anything to do with that. If they you know, ain't going to last long, he'll probably take his money and run away. Well, well, he hasn't. Mm. He'd won more trophies than anybody. He set that club up for life. He's only a ground away from setting up the infrastructure for a long, long time, which I'm sure he'll try to do one day if he's allowed to. Mm. 
And so he hasn't gone away. So he set the tone. Man City came in. We thought, oh, let's see how long this lasts. When they when they got Rubinho and things like that, we're mm. thinking, ah, oh, it's just not going to work. Well, it's worked. You know, now they've got the best manager in the world, paid him 20-odd million a year. It's worked. And so there's a little bit of, in, with football fans, if you can't beat them, join them type mm. scenario in our mindset. And so I don't think it's right for anyone to say to any fan, well, I don't think, to say, well, you should object to this. When they sit there watching... Chelsea bowl up and Man City bowl up to their grounds and smash them, right, with their newfound resources, uh, which they didn't grow organically over time, you know. So um, so Newcastle, I read there was a poll the other day about Newcastle fans, whether they objected to the takeover or not. I think it's 90 percent room favour. And if you think about it from purely from a fan point of view, they want to have good days in the sun. And the maths is very easy to compute. Mm. We've got a Saudi regime. They have money. We need money into our team. We see better team. We have better days. Yes, yeah. it's very very simple. Let's not overcomplicate how a fan thinks, right? So, and that's what they're thinking right now today. And they're sitting there watching Sky Sports News, waiting for it to go through. And um, so, from an Arsenal fan perspective, we're thinking, oh god, we're trying we're trying to crack this top four, which is nearly uncrackable, due to the two of those clubs being resourced where they are. Liverpool being ultra smart at the moment, although I think their cycle is just going over the top. And Manchester United being the cash cow they are, they're just too stupid to be ahead of um, the others at the moment. They're making <laughs> dumb decisions. But once they wake up and get their brains right, they're going to realise they are the biggest, richest mm. club in the world and then actually be that. You know, and and we're also, we're, we're, we're yapping away at their heels with a, with a young team. If we get another competitor come in, alongside smart clubs like Leicester and a growing Everton and a growing Aston Villa and, you know, teams you know, really developing themselves, we're thinking it's going to be a long day before we are taking those Knights versus Bayern Munich for granted, which I certainly did a few years ago. So yeah. it does definitely cloud the picture. Well, it does. I mean, like when you say that, it, it almost sounds like, well, this is going to make the Premier League a bit more competitive. But what I think it does is it pushes us further and further down the road of of, you know, there's no way to compete. You can be smart, but you really can't compete unless you've got billions. And look, from an Arsenal fan perspective, it's very difficult for us to take the moral high ground. I wrote about this on the blog yesterday. You know, our owners, our sponsors, you know, our shirt sponsor, stadium sponsor, sleeve sponsor, they don't yeah. really stand up to a great deal of scrutiny. Our owner is a billionaire. So who are we to say to any other club, well, this is not right. You should be morally opposed to this while we have all that to deal with ourselves, that cognitive dissonance that you have as a football fan. Because... You know, the days on the pitch, as I think it was Ian Stone said to me on Twitter that yesterday, you know, the Spurs game was brilliant. It was really enjoyable. And that really is what keeps you interested and invested because those moments of sporting joy are what we've all grown up for and what we've all grown up with, rather. And those are the things that we want. We want that week in, week out. But like... The, the wider context of how football has been run and, and who is allowed do what, who is allowed own football clubs. I mean, if you're a Newcastle fan and you hate Mike Ashley, as most of them do, and they hate Steve Bruce, a lot of them hate Steve Bruce, like you say, they, they want, yeah, they want something better. So if you're owned by somebody that you hate and literally anyone comes along and says, I'm going to buy you and I'm going to bring in a, a shitload of money. Like, you know, it's yeah, hard what, to turn away. yeah, it is. Of course, it's really hard to turn away from. And, and like, on what basis should the Newcastle fan, for example, be more morally discerning than Boris Johnson or the UK government who do trade deals with Saudi Arabia, who sell arms to Saudi Arabia? This is apparently fine, but them buying my football club I'm supposed to stand up and and look again it's not to say that this is something I agree with but this is I think it goes far beyond what what football fans can do uh, and maybe should be um expected to do like why why are Newcastle yeah. why are there so many think pieces about what why Newcastle fans should object to this and there has been nothing but like 10 years of of 
whitewashed stories about what a brilliantly run club Manchester City are, um, you know, the investment they've made in the team and the community in this, you know, the local area, blah, 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 which is just sports washing and whitewashing of of the of the ownership of of Manchester City you know it's Absolutely. it feels like it, it's almost like there's a there's a there are some gatekeepers here like it's okay if you're this if you're it's okay but we don't want another one you know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. We don't want you to yeah. have your day in the sun, Newcastle fans and Newcastle people. We're okay with this lot, but not you. Why Why them all of a sudden? Mm. It's like it's almost it's one too many. So when Man City are smashing us 5 0 with, with their deep squad, I don't see any pieces in the Sunday Times afterwards saying, well, Man City squad was worth this and Arsenal was worth it. No, we got smashed. Let's fire the manager. What's his club doing? Arsenal broken cannons, the whole thing. Mm. They don't think about how they got to that position. You know, and when I'm old enough to remember when Man City were in League One, right? So, um, mm. and it wasn't so long ago, you know, and um, so so they have, you know, they're struggling to fill out their crowd on certain days and, and Arsenal fans are sniggering in the background. It doesn't matter. They've got the money, they've got the cash, they've got the resources, they've got the infrastructure. They have the smart people on top of it and they are looking at us and saying, yeah, what are you going to do? Mm. You know, and we're worried at Newcastle. No, not worried, but the initial gut feeling as an Arsenal fan is, here comes another one. Yeah, here comes another one, and and now what? Now what does that mean for us? It doesn't mean that well, I don't think we should. I totally agree. We should be sitting there saying you need to be suddenly the the moral high ground people, Newcastle fans. No, it's up to the game to govern itself, and that's the problem we have. The game hasn't got the governance it requires. It hasn't, it's protected itself for certain people mm. and not for the game overall. Um, there is so much money left on the table with football and the way it's covered from a media perspective. These people are not getting involved to give money away for free. They're getting involved because there's a, there's a chance to get money back as well and there's a chance to move money around, shall we say, <laughs> and move money around and and actually grow your yourself, your brand, and, and make you a far more uh, honourable person in the world if you're linked to any particular people. So this is the new world, mate, that we're, we're, we're walking towards. And Arsenal, with, his, with its history, and maybe a Liverpool with its history, as, you know, two of the top three clubs in the country historically, history is not going to pay for, you know, strikers on a half million pound a week. It's not going to pay for... 200 million pound training grounds which a lot of these clubs are doing now mm. or working towards this is what you have to compete with so when you get a player to come to your club and he goes to a training ground and and they see this spaceship there they, they're going to sign there you know and um, don't think it won't happen it will happen a football's career is very very short if they can make the money they'll make it anywhere because they've got 50 years to live after they're finished playing football and no one cares about them, you know, so they have to look after mm. themselves, their families and their family's family. So it's going to be interesting to watch this to see how it's covered in the media, actually, Andrew. I think that's going to be the key thing. Is it suddenly one too many? Is Newcastle the one that's make people actually look at themselves and say, actually, are we? Uh, is this game going in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, look, the, we've got to say that money being a driving force in football um is is not a new thing, right? Um, you still there? Yeah, yeah. I'm still here. Sorry. And Sorry. It, it's historically it has been a a driving force within the game, and yeah. you can go back decades and decades and decades and see how important it has been to successful clubs to have money, and and even back as far as the early days of the Premier League when Blackburn had their, in inverted commas, Sugar Daddy and Jack Walker, who came in and spent a load of money, um, I mean, it's a pittance compared to what, uh, what what's being spent now and the kind of but investment that's, that's being made in clubs. But he was a, he was a Blackburn fan. So yeah, he, he, local man made good, wasn't yeah. he? Local man made good, and he's decided to spend his money in the right way on his local club mm. and do something for them. And we all thought, that's, that's the good... British English spirit. Well done, sir. Well done. So, yeah. Things have changed. <laughs> they, they certainly have changed. Um, but, uh, you know, is there a point at which um, the... I mean, the genie is well and truly out of the bottle now when it comes to finances, when it comes to the way that football is is 
football clubs are funded and owned, the way that football itself is run, not as a sport, but as a gigantic um, money printing machine in all its various forms, decisions we look at, stuff like, you know, the World Cup every two years. And for all the justifications that Arsene Wenger might make about it, we know that realistically the driver for this is for FIFA to generate even more money, a billion, multi-billion dollar organization mired in corruption down the years. But it has been always that way. But, you know, is it impossible at this point to try and do something about it where we have scenarios like this where like it's not possible to properly do something about uh a club being bought by a nation state by an oligarch a billionaire whatever it might be which is impossible really to justify on any moral ground but when you look around at the way the game is and what's going on at UEFA, at FIFA, uh, in the various national associations, you know, the corruption that exists and has existed in, in various forms throughout the years and down the years, this all just feels like an inevitability and there isn't anything that we can really do about it, no matter how much on a conscientious level we might object. Yeah, I think, I think football governing itself particularly if you've got a game with so much money around it, I'm surprised there are not more financial scandals. You know, mm. so that, what does that tell you? I, I think it tells you that people are not looking too closely. You know, there's yeah. so much money flowing around. They're not looking too closely because it suits certain people. You know, mm. when you see a transfer deal go through and you think, oh, okay, that's 20 million a bit heavy. Do you ever ask yourself the question? Do you say, well, you know what? We need to negotiate a better price. Or do you ever say, well, where's that 20 million gone? You know, and I, I've, all were to look I've wondered about that with a couple of our transfers. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> I think where where's that twenty million gone? You know, yeah. do you, yeah. so when you when you sent something, it, what happened? Does it ever get investigated? You know, it doesn't get investigated. We just pay more money for our burgers and off we go. Right? Or, so, or, or uh, maybe it does get investigated, but but for the purposes of uh, self, uh, what do you call it, keeping face, nothing yeah. ever becomes public. Nothing becomes public, right? So self-preservation rules, right? So mm. can we look after our reputation? Our reputation is everything. It's gold. And so, you know, we obviously we think about Arsenal, but there are many clubs around the world. When you start getting things like the transfer market and cash moving around, payments moving around, are you telling me that there isn't more financial scandals going on? Mm. When you lift this up, you lift this up to clubs being owned by states. And you, you lift... You know, you look at sponsorships, Adidas, and like how this all links together. World Cup, certain countries getting World Cup. Come on, it is, mm. it's all out there if you want to look at it. You know, but what generally happens is, with us, I mean, we're still buzzing about the Spurs game. There's always another game to care about. Mm. There's always a bad management decision to care about, a bad substitution, a bad result, a good result. And sometimes that masks what's really happening underneath. And until you get a bit of time in the international break to look and think, and then this breaks, and then you start to think, what is actually happening? And it was only a couple of weeks ago we talked about Derby County. Derby County, you know, going into administration. I mean, I never thought I'd see the day. I've been to that ground. They've got a lovely new ground up there. They're a proper big club. And look where they are. Look what's happening to Barcelona right now. There needs to be some form of financial governance and management. You can say, well, these clubs are stupid and they've been taken advantage of. Well, we've been taken advantage of in the past, you know, and we've managed to recover. So I do think there's a problem for the game. The game, I had this feeling that the game's going to eat itself. There's going to be casualties. It, you know, the Derby County thing, it can't happen. What's happening with Newcastle? Okay, it's, it's just to be confirmed, but... Where's that going to go? How's that going to have ramifications around the league? How's the rest of the league going to feel about it? The top six haven't got the um, the cachet they once did because they wanted to break away a little while ago. Yeah, they can't say too much. You know, <laughs> in, in five years' time, will, will Newcastle be in that top six? The game is totally. Although it's a game that we've all grown up with, Andrew, I think there's a new game appearing in front of us. Mm. You know, and. 
I always said about Arsenal last year was a development year for us as a as a team, as people, as a club. This year is about positioning, repositioning, carrying on that development with younger players and people, but repositioning. When I say repositioning, I mean repositioning in the world's game, getting our position back mm. for when the game changes. And it will change, and we need to be positioned. We need to be at the top end of it. And other clubs are thinking exactly the same things. It's almost like a cycling race, and you want to be at the front of the peloton, and everyone's fighting for the same piece of road. And it's how you're getting there, and how you're the how we don't look too closely at. Mm. We just we just want to get there, we want to get to the front of the race. It. I mean, it would be a depressing to, uh, thought to think that there isn't room in football for again i'm saying this you know when arsenal spent more money than anybody else yeah. in the transfer market this window uh, f- via our billionaire owners however that was financed that's neither here nor there we still spent more money than any other team in the in the premier league i think this summer so you know that that's kind of what we're looking for but yeah. um it would be depressing to think that there isn't a isn't room for a team to blossom, to develop, to have a chance to be competitive because it's well run, because it's smart, because it's got good recruitment, because it's got a, an exceptional coach or an exceptional manager. It develops some some outstanding talent. You know, maybe that won't matter in a few years' time because there'll just be so many teams who've got this ownership model, which creates a kind of equalization at that level, at the top level, right? Because Mm. there is a direct correlation between how much money you spend and how good your team can be and how successful it's going to be. There's always going to be a level of of, um, difference or whatever between the top teams within that sort of top I want to call it a super league, if you like, but that that conjures up some some difficult memories for us. But you know what I mean. So if there's like six, seven clubs that are that are just m- vastly more wealthy than anyone else, within that there's going to be one or two clubs that are more wealthy than the others, or better than the others, or more established. But below that, there's simply no chance for anybody, regardless of how well they work or how hard they try to break into that top group. I mean. We might as well have the European Super League then at that point. Yeah. Exactly. Because what's happening is you're almost redefining success, right? So as you were talking then, the first thing that came to my mind was Leicester, right? So Leicester mm. won the FA Cup and League in the last five years or so. Will that happen again? They're smart, mm. you know? They're, they are an ultra smart club, but everyone's being smart now. And before you know, you're going to steal their players. A couple of transfer mistake, recruitment mistakes, and they're back in mid-table. Right, so Brentford, another good example of a smart club, has thought their way through to get to this point in time. What does success look like for them? What does success look like for Brighton, another club, sparkling training ground, new new ground, smart recruitment, mm. good good executive, good people infrastructure? What does success look like for them? You know, and I think maybe I mean, people might not like it. We might have to, as Arsenal fans, readdress what success looks like. And the guy that used to be here for 22 years said that the top four is a, is a trophy and everyone laughed at him. It looks like a really big trophy right now, doesn't it? Mm. it? looks like a really big trophy for lots of people. And they are changing how they operate to get that top four. They're literally doing that to get into those positions. Manchester United. Manchester United, I mean, how, to the 20 league titles they've got. I'm not even sure they're even trying to win anymore. They just need to be in the top four to keep the money going. They don't need to win. You don't need to win to be successful. That's a terrible thing. To, as those words come out of my mind, yeah. out my mouth, I thought, how could you say that, Clive? But do you need to win from a business perspective anymore? Or do you just need to be a top end of the game? I'm not so sure. So I'm sure there'll be a big push now to make the the top four, you know, four teams in Champions League, it, to make it five or six, to increase the success criteria, to make it that. That's going to be the next big push. So European competition is going to be a lot of pressure on them and how they're formed, what the prize money is, as more and more clubs are pushing very, very hard. And I listened to Gary Neville say the other day that the Premier League could be the strongest it's ever been in its history. We could potentially have four of the best teams in the world right now. I'm not sure that's true. A little bit of sky hype. But where this is going, with the with all the best managers in our league, a lot of the better players in our league at the right ages were able to steal talent, young talent, and grow them because everyone's getting smart with their analytics now. Where this is heading is 
when given what's happened to the Spanish superpowers, and Bayern Munich are their sort of in their league, they're well looked after, shall we say. They're the only people who can take the manager and the captain of the team that finished second the previous yeah. year. And everyone seems all right with it, you know? So yeah. I think we are heading towards a point where the Premier League is so strong, so strong. We as Arsenal fans may have to think about what a success really looked like for us going forward. Mm. It's sad, it, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, you, you talked about you know, success and uh, a business success, you know, football clubs as businesses, that's a, a a thing we're all aware of. And it is a, I think as, as fans, not just Arsenal fans, I mean, football fans, we have so much more information than we ever did before about how the clubs are run, the finances and all that kind of stuff. Ultimately, you'd like to think that sporting success is the true driver for any football club, for any football club owner. And and what's interesting as well is that, like, in the grand scheme of things, football clubs are not hugely profitable enterprises or businesses in terms of what they turn over or what sort of profits you make because you're under so much pressure to take whatever money you get and throw it back into the club uh, in the form of transfers and transfer money. And I think there's yeah. there's something that's, um, you know, every football fan wants their team to be better. Every football fan wants transfers. There's so much clamor during the summer and the off season and the January window. We've got to spend, we've got to spend some fucking money and all that kind of stuff where where literally what 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 fans want is for the team to be better to achieve sporting success but in order to 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 fund that sporting success the club also has to be run successfully as a business which then requires a measure of compromise with regards how you view what success is if that makes yeah. sense it, it it does, and it's you know we talked about Newcastle and what it means for the game and how the game is governed, etc. Financially, but before before we started this podcast, the last thing I was doing, I was looking at a couple of YouTubes on Ollie Watkins and Dominic Calvert Lewin, and the reason why <laughs> because we were linked to them. I'm thinking which one's the better player for us, you know? And I'm yeah. looking through, and I'm at, I'm on FB Ref, and I have a look at them, and so I, I, the fact we spent the most money in, in Europe this year. I don't care. I, I want a new centre forward. I'm getting myself ready for it. Yeah. Right? And and that, and I sometimes bring it back to basics, but that's how we think, isn't it? That's how we think. But we're almost ignoring what else is, is happening, mm. you know, to get us here. When you said earlier about we spent the most money in Europe, but Andrew, I don't know where that debt is. Is that debt on the club or is it being loaned to us? I, I don't know. I don't know how we're going to recover that. Are we in a situation? that's not as flanchy healthy as we think it is. I don't know. I, I do know yeah. we've got six really good young players that are 23 and under that have brightened up my life in the last six weeks. You know? And, yeah. Uh, and that's a challenge, isn't it? It's a challenge for us, you know, about where we about where we place our morals, about what, what we care about the most. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing. Um, we're football fans. We are a captive audience. We can produce the kind of mental gymnastics because we love watching the team. We love our clubs. Um, you know, we want to be better than our rivals. All of those things are part of why all of this can happen because it's not that football fans are blind to the the moral dilemmas. It's not that they, well, I, some of them don't care. Let's face it. Some of them don't care, but a lot of people do care. And a lot of people will be uh, uh, objecting. I'm sure there are Newcastle fans who, who are uneasy about the new owners, even if they want new owners. It's like, well, I want something different, but not necessarily this. I mean, I get it, but part of what allows broadcasters to move fixtures and clubs to sell their souls to gambling companies and cryptocurrency trading companies and all that kind of stuff is that ultimately they, they kind of, not that they get forgiven, but we, like you say, we want to see the next game. We want to see the next 
goal, hit the top corner. We want to lift the cup. We want to we want to just enjoy the football. We are a captive audience. The same way it was with season tickets. You know what I mean? They can squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. Um, I'm, I'm not saying this about Arsenal. I'm just talking about in general. They can always squeeze people to the point where they're dry because there are people who are, are liquid coming up behind them who can take their place. And that is the reality of football and being a football fan. Yeah, we can't miss out, can we? So I'm going, I need, I need my ticket. I need to keep going. I need yeah. to keep going. I can't miss out. I can't miss that Spurs day or being around or, or being linked and engaged to the club around that day. No chance. I'm not walking away. I'm staying. <laughs> so and and they and they and they know that, right? And they absolutely do. I I tell you, I tell you, mate. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. How the media covers this. Because it's, uh, I found it incredible how the media rallied around and smashed the Super League. They smashed it because mm. it, it, it wasn't well thought through. We can all agree on that. But there's something behind that message that's coming back. And we know that too, right? So those guys are not stupid, right? So, But the way particularly Sky smashed that message, because it doesn't, it doesn't suit them. Well, it yeah, doesn't suit their control. It, it doesn't yeah. suit their model. Well, I mean, the Super League has a huge impact on the Premier League and the Premier League is their bread and butter. So, exactly. you know, look, I think if, if if there are journalists, if there are reporters, if there are investigations going on about, you know, the Newcastle ownership, they've got to be applied across the board. You can sort of allow one owner to be vilified when there are other owners. And I realize that there are levels. There are certainly mm. levels of... of I don't know what the right word is, moral ambiguity or, or you know, I don't, I don't quite know how to phrase this, you know, because there are, um, as I mentioned, with our owners, with our sponsors, there are various things that don't stand up to a lot of scrutiny. And, and it's certainly yeah. true that, you know, maybe one is, I'm not going to say worse than the other, but, but less bad than the other, you know what I mean? But yeah, absolutely. if you're going to pillory Newcastle's owners, then how do you dismantle what Man City have done? Not just yeah. in, not just in, uh, the Premier League, but they bought football clubs all over the world to sort of present this shiny image of that particular uh, regime. You know, exactly. it's it's a classic case of, you know, present a shiny image. It's well run. It's smart. It's intelligent. It's glossy. It's a marketing brochure for for you know that investment group, et cetera, et cetera. But it it has to be consistent. And if there are going to be genuine objections or or if this is the the straw that broke the camel's back if you like then somebody's got to start coming up with a solution or, or ways in which some measure of financial equanimity can be applied to not just the premier league but football in general across europe because otherwise the inevitable thing is we're going to end up back in the european super league situation yeah. again and this gigantic um, money pit of whatever it is is just going to be inevitable. And those clubs will say, you know what, I'm not going to wait for Newcastle to take my place in Super League. Yeah, just get yeah, back yeah. around the table again, right? And so let's have another discussion about how we can do this, how we can make this better. They're going to protect themselves, and that's just human, human behavior. It's going to be interesting to see how Sky in particular cover this because they do own the Premier League coverage, basically. Mm. And are they going to embrace it as another competitor to make the, the Premier League even more competitive? You bet. Or are they going to investigate it, you know, send their investigative journalists off? The fact they're outside Newcastle's ground today having every, uh, an update with 15 minutes tells me they're going to report on it and potentially embrace it, because of, like they did Man City, etc. So I think that's it's going to be... I'll tell you what, Andrew, the media coverage of this end-to-end -end, is going to be revealing. It really is. It's going to be revealing. And let's see what picture we get painted because we are the customer of that media. And let's mm. see what picture we get painted. And I think that's going to be so interesting. All right. Well, look, let's see what happens, um, you know, over the coming months and years at Newcastle United. These things do take a little bit of time to get going. And I think you're right that when some of the clubs in the Premier League see uh, a new potential big boy, a new shark circling the waters, they might want to just put up the nets um, yep. and, and make something happen. So, look, 
Uh, it's all ahead of us. We should talk a little bit about Arsenal. One of the things I want to ask you about is, um, you know, the last four games have been better. Uh, there's no question yep. about that. And everyone feels a little bit better about what's going on after the, the opening three games of the season. But Arsenal have, I think, a particular issue um, in that we we still have this problem with goals uh, and that we don't score enough goals uh, and that there isn't necessarily faith in what we've got to produce the kind of goal tally that will propel us to the position we want to see the club end up in uh, this summer. Uh, and I'm curious to think or to get your thoughts on this and and whether or not you think that what we've seen from Mikel Arteta in the 20 months or 22 months or whatever it is that he has been in charge at this point. Have you seen enough to suggest that there might be something that could make us click from that perspective? Or is it a case that we are going to endure this sort of patchy uh, goal scoring form, if you like? I mean, maybe it doesn't matter too much if we win every game one nil. I'm not sure that that's going to be the case. But you know, it, it does feel like this is the next big area that we've got to improve on uh, and pretty quickly. Yeah, and what that tells you is we, we've improved in other areas. <laughs> could, we not, could we spend our money on, on, on defence and defenders and goalkeepers that we, we've seen the improvement there? So our minds will naturally go forward. Mm. I think, I was just talking to Elliot about this other day, actually. I, I find, I try not to look at the, the team through the manager, but I, I will say I do find this manager really, really interesting. Because despite his rocky time at Arsenal, you know, some of that where he's been disconnected from us, we, we've won massive games when there's no one in the crowd, we've mm. won a trophy when no one's in the ground, right? So that's unheard of. So that connection we've missed. And I think we reconnected recently, and I've been to the ground this season, and it just feels different. It feels different. Everything around it feels different. Even when we're getting beaten, it feels different. That could be a post-pandemic thing, I'm not too sure, but I see a reconnection happening within the club mm. and I see a focus within the club to reconnect to its fan base, without a doubt, without a doubt. They are putting those fans, particularly that go to the ground, they are putting them on a pedestal. And I was thinking about this the other day, I was thinking, well, why is that? I mean, there's many reasons for it, but it's well overdue. I started to think a bit more deeply about it and I started to think, well, in this media age, in this social media age, where it's impossible to control people behind the keyboard. You know, we've got some examples where that can go wrong, abuse, etc. But you can control your connection to the the fan, particularly the match going fan, and you can show that you care about that fan. And then that permeates itself out into the wider ether, shall we say, the global 20, 30 million fans that are out there. Yeah. I think this is something which I find really interesting about the post-pandemic Arsenal. And I've... And I think almost like there's a post-pandemic Arteta as well and a post-pandemic team. There's a freshness to this team that has made people maybe step back and think, hmm, this is quite interesting. But where is it going to lead? We're looking for that click, that moment that says we're back. And it comes back to us fighting our expectations. What are our expectations today of this club where we are, of this team where we are? Are we a... Is top six, is that it for us now? Do we want to get to top six first? Will we look at top four? Let's get to top six and then build again and try to look for the next steps. Is top four attainable? I think that, that expectation of success is driving our judgment, our judgment of what we're seeing. And what is that based on? That's based on your previous history of how you watched the team, how you engaged the team and the structures by which you always supported the team. And those structures have been challenged they're being challenged by what we are as a club. We've got the youngest team in the Premier League and we are Arsenal Football Club with the youngest team in the Premier League. That hasn't happened before a long time. No. So things are changing around us and we're, we're as fans, we're forced to look at things slightly different. And, and it's a challenge for some people. It's a challenge for me, right? It's a challenge for me. But it's a challenge for some people. We always, we always arrive at that place to judge the team at a different pace. And I think that's the challenge, and that's where you get discourse, and that's where you get arguments, because some people are not changing their expectations. They think, well, I just want us to be back where we used to be, and we're not there, so let's get rid of this guy. Bang, mm. let's do it. You know, And some people are stepping back and looking at it a little bit differently and saying, okay, this is a process. I hate that word, but it is. It's a project. I hate that word, but it is. And 
and some people can deal with that and some people can't and some people on that journey are really in you know really analyzing it i look at this team and i think i like what we're trying to do i really do um I say that as a fan have seen the glory day, so I'm not worried. I've seen it, and it'll come back again. I know it will, but I like what we're trying to do. I like how we've addressed this. It feels a little bit late, but we're here now. It doesn't really matter, really, to gain what happened in the past. I like what we're trying to do. I like these players we brought in. The next steps of this team are in the forward areas because where the team at the back door is age profile-wise it's not where the team is at some of the front two strikers who are a little bit older. Mm. Can they carry us to the next level? I'm not so sure. Have we got enough bullets in the gun to give it to them to go and do their work? I'm not so sure. It's going to have to be a collective effort. It's going to have to be a coaching effort. And I'm looking for the click, and I'm not sure it's within the club to really get those three, four nilers every single week. But we have had that sunny day the other week at the Emirates. We have seen a team when the when the game suits us, it can deliver offensively. So we just have to keep building those relationships, building the experience of these players, building their efficiencies, and I think we will be in a better place. But the real answer, I think, is in the transfer market, mate. I'm afraid. Well, look, I I think that there is, you know, obviously uh, the the next signing. I said this to James on one of the Patreon uh, the Patreon pod we did during the week. I think the next big signing we make will be a striker and I don't mm. think it will be January I think it'll be next summer because you can't really get a good striker uh, in January unless something crazy happens in the market and I don't yeah. really expect that so I think that's that's certainly an issue for next season the 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 issue now though is we've got most of a season still to play and we've yeah. got to get a tune out of the players that we've got and I wonder if the absence of Granite Xhaka, uh, and I don't want to make this about Granite Xhaka, I just want to make this about what Mikel Arteta is going to do without Granite Xhaka, is going to be a move more towards that 4-3-3, as we saw against Burnley. It didn't quite click on the day, but I think there were moments where, with a better touch, with a better pass in the final third, I think that that game would have been more comfortable from an Arsenal perspective. Yeah. Is it about getting an extra goal-scoring player on the pitch? You know, if you don't have Granite Jack and you don't start uh, Lukonga, for example, you've got to fill the rest of the team with uh, players uh, like Pepe, like Saka, like Smith-Rowe, like Odegaard, like uh, Aubameyang up front, um, maybe Martinelli, that kind of thing that, that perhaps, if not necessarily the style of play as much as the um, the sheer number of attacking players that are on the pitch. Yeah, do it, do it with numbers. And yeah, because I'm I'm like you. I'm I'm looking at the way forward. I'm thinking, mm. okay, can we get a tune out of Lacazette and Aubameyang for how long? But then I, I've, there's a couple of games that I found really instructive this week. There was the obviously the Man City Liverpool game last weekend. I mean, okay, Man City got high quality players, but there's there is no centre forward on that pitch. And they're able, with their attacking group, mm. to create a pattern of play that makes you feel as though that we, you don't really miss one too much, you know? Uh, what Spain versus Italy last night. Absolutely fantastic game. Fantastic game. You know, there were forward players on there, but not that stick-on centre-forward playing for, for Spain in particular. And I think we have to develop another way get like-minded players. You've heard Arteta speak about, I want to get something called one brain football going within the team, so you play with one brain. I love that phrase. When I watched Man City play in the first half against Liverpool last week, I was watching them exit out of there out from their goalkeeper's hands and get out and, and go past Liverpool press. And I was looking at this thinking, this is super impressive. This is super impressive composure and belief to stick to your game plan, to force a team at Liverpool back on their heels at home for them at Anfield. And I was so impressed by that. I was I was so impressed how Man City stuck to their game plan and forced Liverpool back. And I'm thinking, God, we, I'd love us to do something like this. Keep playing, keep playing, keep playing. And they did it without a real forward. And I think we have to find another way. This is when we can look at the manager and say, how are you going to create a pattern of play and that's going to make us be that collective be a collective offensive unit rather than wait for one guy to score 20 goals yeah. and that's where we've been for the last few years with Bam Yang until he didn't and we've faced eight you know so I think there's another way to do it 
I, I, I do think um, it's the four three three. And I haven't been a fan of the four three three for Arsenal right? because of our players. Our players have been a four two three one team or a back three team for me. And so, but now Shaq has gone. To back to your point, this is a chance. This is an opportunity to do things slightly differently, to incorporate some of these players that we have seen develop in their early part of their career. They're ready for the next chance, like a Martinelli, for example, a good example. Obviously, Smith Rose arrived. Odegaard's now here permanently. Mm. There are players that bring an offensive intensity that we could use, not just offensively, but defensively to make up for the lack of a second double pivot player and really get some combination play going. And I think it's going to be so interesting to see how he takes his team on right from here on now. Because because of the Shaka injury, there is a window open. Mm. Now, how do you fit it? Do you fit it with caution? Do you stick an L Nenny in and say this team's young enough already? I need some. I need some experience there. I need to have my wall there, and I go around it. Do you add a mate and Niles in there? That's on particular days. Do you allow Sambi to grow in that position? Or do you say, you know what, I'm going to bring in a Martelli and a Pepe, I'm going to drop Odegaard deeper, I'm going to look after that football and control the game. You know, and a, there's a lot of fans would like to see maybe the latter, you know, a bit mm. more control, technical control, going back to what we are you know, renowned for in the last 20 years. And I've always been a guy that's been quite pragmatic about how I look at football, particularly in that central box. But I'm thinking for this team, we're now ready for the next phase. And I think that is ball players in the centre of the pitch. If Man City turned up with two holding midfielders, we'd all think, "What's wrong with Pep today?" Yeah, we've got we've got used to one. You know, what is is Fernandinho or is Rodri? Simple as that. If they played both, we think, "What's up with him today? What's he afraid of?" So, what are we afraid of? Play the one guy we know who he is, and let's put some good bodies around him and go from there. All right, that sounds good to me. Uh, <laughs> I, I like the idea of it. Like it's it's like with the new players, you know. When, when they come in, it brings a sort of freshness. And with the freshness, you can start to see not quite light at the end of the tunnel, but you, you can see how things might be a bit different and, and all the rest. So, look, I hope that's something that we do see, um, you know, particularly in these games after the international break where where I think we have a run of fairly, well, I'm not going to say winnable, but you know what I mean. I'm not going to say it. I think we've got a run of fixtures which could produce, which should produce, a decent number of points for Arsenal, you know, based on the squad that we have until we face Liverpool. And there's our next kind of marker, if you like, to see what kind of progression there has been to that point. Um, you know, and then we'll see what Liverpool do to us. <laughs> and we'll yeah. take it from there. <laughs> we struggle with Liverpool. We struggle with the intensity by which they play at. Yeah. But I, what I will say is I feel we are better movers now. We are better moving across the ground. I think we have less vulnerability physically, mm. you know, and I think we can get to a higher intensity. I do worry about us late in games. We all seem to be cramping up, for etc. But I do, when I look at the team now and I look across the pitch, I don't see the same athletic vulnerability, shall mm. we say. You know, and I think it's going to be interesting to see, again, how we develop that. He's got time on the training pitch. I think there's room to improve our intensity levels for longer periods. We're still playing patches, um, but those patches can be glorious, as we've seen recently, yeah. right? So we need we need more of them. We need more of them. I still think there's a softness and a brittleness to the squad. I think we like around 14, 15 players tops. If we start to lose... In, anymore we're, I think we're into people that we may not trust the same way so there's still work to do mm. but um, I like this group and I'm I'm hopeful that we can look after their careers see their development retain them um, and get through the fact that we are the youngest team and soon not be the youngest team be the youngest most experienced team around yeah. and more players like Ramsdale for example who are young and experienced we know going to have a bad day, but they've connected to us and we're ready to support them. And I think it's really refreshing. All right. Well, look, uh, thank you as always for your time, Clive. Great to talk to you. Uh, people can check you out, of course, on the Arsenal Vision podcast as well. For now, though, we better leave it there. We'll catch up with you again soon. Take care, mate. Thank you very much indeed to Clive. You can find him on Twitter. He is at Clive P A F C at Clive P A F C and part of the Arsenal Vision podcast crew. If you're not already subscribed and you need more Arsenal content in your life, I highly recommend it.
Okay, my next guest this week is an Arsenal season ticket holder, a writer, co-owner of Gunnerstown. He's got a brand new book coming out. We're going to talk all about it. It is Dave Seeger. Dave, how are you? Morning, Andrew. Very well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. So look, the new book is coming out soon. It's called Arsenal for Everyone. Can you give us a bit of background on why exactly uh, you chose this particular subject and, and... uh, and what was the sort of the driving force behind this book? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it, it's a, it's an it's an awkward one in a way because I was after I lost my son, I sort of I, I didn't fall out of love with football, but my I found my relationship with football had changed. I mean, if I explain that in that, you know, I'm never going to not watch an Arsenal game. I'm never going to not go when I get the chance. I'm mm. always going to want to win. But I found that certainly during lockdown, when they lost, it was a case of. Ah, oh, there's another game, which is not the old me. And it was so much of my footballing life was linked with either coaching my son, watching my son, going to football with my son. I just found that it's like the quote, I think, you know, football really is the the, the most important thing of the unimportant things in life. Mm. And I, I, I'd never felt like that before. And I did feel like that now. So when I was trying to get my writing mojo back, I was trying to think, think of something, if you like, that fitted my state of mind. Mm. And it was what I sit next to Alex Brooker, what I have for years uh, in the stadium. And uh, it was watching his documentary to a degree and the inspirational, you know, documentary he did for the BBC. And I just started me thinking about other people who whose frame of reference and way of supporting the club is going to be different through no fault of their own. Now, I'm not comparing my situation to, to having a disability, but it's the same in the sense that I feel differently and on my frame of reference is different through no fault of my own. And that's exactly the same. So I thought, okay, what about if I start talking to some disabled fans about their support for Arsenal? And, you know, it originally might have been for a few blogs, but it just grew and grew and grew. Mm. It obviously became the book. And it was just a fascinating journey, to be quite frank. You mentioned the loss of your son, Liam. Yeah. He must have been an integral part of your Arsenal life. I'm not going to talk about the the sort of normal platitudes that people would, because the relationship, you know, between a father and a son and, and losing a child must be the most incomprehensible thing, but just as part of your your footballing life, your Arsenal life, your Arsenal supporting life, to to have that so impacted by his loss as well, that's what caused this this sort of change of your perspective on on football and life, I'm sure, but but football yeah, no, in particular, which I think we all to some extent use as an escape as much as we can, even though we get a bit invested in it at mm-hmm. times. It doesn't do us <laughs> doesn't do us good from time to time. But you know, to to come to terms with that, how was it helpful to talk to people with disabilities to to understand that that other people perhaps are seeing things in a different way? Oh no, absolutely. I mean, and it, it it brings you know I keep using the word context, but it, it, it puts things in context because you know you you it helps you appreciate you know how things are for other people who don't have all the things you have, you, you can't, you know, as I think I use in one of the, you know, they, they may have never seen the ball hit the back of the net. They may have never heard the, the roar of the crowd. You know, they may never have been able to jump up when we scored, but they still feel it. They still feel it the same. And, it, and it's the same, but different. And it's, and it was really, really, really rewarding to meet all these individuals. And, and, and I'm just in awe of them, to be honest with you. And some of them are not just fans. Some of them are actually campaigners to get things to, to change mm. for disabled support, you know, to get the accessibility the same, to get the experience as close to that of an able-bodied fan. So, yeah, I'm just, I mean, it was humbling, really. Um, you know, that's the only word for it. You know, you just feel, oh, God, I've had it bad, but crikey, you know, this is a life. This is not just something that's changed your life. This is, you know, and particularly some of these people who, who may have begun sighted or able-bodied and have become partially sighted or blind and not able-bodied mm. that's another thing to do with isn't it you know so this yeah i mean it was a it was an amazing thing and you know i hope liam would have been proud of it to be honest i mean it's um yeah it, it, it's become so much more than i thought it would and obviously the club asked all themselves getting involved and that's been that's been one of the most rewarding parts of the journey is because we can all get on the Arsenal's back, you know, the team's back. We can all talk about the Cronkies. There's lots of things that we as fans aren't happy about. Yeah. And you've talked about it as much as anyone. But what what, what I fundamentally I realised, and I think I always knew, is Arsenal Football Club is the people who work in it, not the people who own it. Mm. And And as I interviewed more people, the same names. Alan Francis, Arsenal's Disability Access Officer, his team, you know, the, the Arsenal and the community, the work they do with, with these fans, 
And so to, it got to the point where I actually thought, well, I need to be interviewing these people as well. And that was the difference between the club then said, well, if you're going to interview the people, we're happy for you to do that, but we need to see those chapters. So there were two chapters that are totally with Arsenal staff. Mm. And that's when the club read the chapters, not only liked them and said, well, this is, we think we're making Arsenal for everyone is the mantra. It's been the mantra for Arsenal for yeah. inclusive and diversity since 2008. I think most fans have probably subliminally just forgotten that or the club by their own admission, maybe haven't done enough or haven't communicated it enough. Those that are affected by it or impacted immediately know, but the wider community of fans possibly don't know mm. how much Arsenal do for disabled fans. So that was an incredibly rewarding part of the journey that really opened my eyes. And it just made me so proud that that's the club, that's my club, because we actually do a lot more than other clubs, Andrew, a lot more. I guess the, the thing about it is we don't, if, if you're like you or me and we don't have any issues we're not aware of the things no. that that arsenal have done and you know they do a lot um i think it is important at times like you say to separate the ownership or the issues that we might have or the frustrations that we might have with the team with the executives with you know all of the things that we as fans as normal football fans can get frustrated with but also recognize that arsenal in the community the rainbow laces project the the arsenal for everyone that ethos that runs through a lot of the work that that the club do and the uh, people at the club do is so um, fundamental and so powerful and means so much to the people that it's uh, that it's aimed to help. So it, it's not for you and it's not for me, uh, but it is for those people and, and it helps and it, it creates an environment which hopefully um, makes them feel better and makes them feel more comfortable with their Arsenal support, with their Arsenal experience, with with feeling welcomed, with feeling part of of the yeah. Arsenal fan community. Yeah, and it's it's hugely important, and and it's as I say, it's not necessarily known. Mm. I mean, I'll give the example. I mean, I'll, I'll give a good example. Yeah, in the two good examples that came out. Obviously, I didn't know before I did the book. Firstly, every club in the Premier League has to have one of two roles. It's either a disability access officer or disability liaison officer. Now they're marginally different roles. Arsenal have both. You know, so okay, if there's two roles that need to be had, we're going to have both of them. We're not going to decide which we want. We're going to have both. But what's really interesting, and I'm not going to name other clubs here. But a lot of clubs, knowing they have to have a disability liaison officer, will just give that role to someone else. Oh, can you just put this hat on as well? Mm. Now, that tells you that they're not not—they're just paying lip service to what's required rather than taking it seriously. Yeah. So as, as Alan Francis, who is our disability access officer, said to me, it would be like asking Mark Brindle to do my job or me to do Mark's job and just saying you can do both. They're both massive roles. And we just, you know, just yeah. do the other one. Fudge it. And, and a lot of other clubs have that, and Premier League clubs as well. So that's one thing. And the other thing that's really fascinating, you know, and again, it's a wider story, but it came out because I've got four chapters with either blind or partially sighted individuals. And this, you know, I, I, I say to people, I talk about this a lot, close your eyes and, and watch. When you're watching a television commentary, close your eyes or listen, and, and mm. you realise how quickly, how rubbish it is. <laughs> radio radio is marginal. Now, you know, Jermaine Jean is saying it's in the hole or pockets of space. It means absolutely nothing yeah, yeah. to most fans. And if you're blind, it means less than nothing. Yeah. So if obviously if you're blind or partially sighted, what you need is Dave passed to Andrew, Andrew passed to James, McNichols put it in the back of the net. That's what you need. Yeah. You need you need the to be able to visualise in your mind what's actually happening on the pitch. So most clubs, and again, every Premier League has to, has to, it's a compulsory to have audio commentary for blind or partially sighted fans. Now, a lot of clubs will just link that audio commentary, that their earphone, to a local radio station, which will always be about 30 seconds behind the game. Uh, Premier League clubs are doing that. Or they'll just have their normal commentary team, mm. would be on Arsenal.com. Arsenal don't. Arsenal have a completely separate team. There are 10 staff in the team, five on, five off each match day. Two of them do the commentary, proper commentary, ball by ball, tackle by tackle, pass by pass, with a co-commentator. Two people run the technology, make sure nothing goes wrong. So I said to Alan, so what does the fifth person do? The fifth person gives one-to-one -one commentary to one of our eldest blind fans, Peter Gosnell. You've probably heard of him, the artist, the blind artist. Mm. He was on the pitch at Wembley before the Villa Cup final. I think he's in 83, 84 now. He's got tinnitus, so he can't put headphones in. So Arsenal provide him, sitting next to him, as well as his own carer, full-time, every home match day, full commentary, one-to-one -one in his ear verbally. Wow. Arsenal play for that. Now, you would never even think about these things. No, no. But, wow. You know, and it's a, it's a case of Arsenal go above and beyond in virtually every area, but 
they're not resting on their laurels. They're always looking to do new things, more things. Um, and that became abundantly apparent. So That's amazing. Really proud of the club. Yeah, yeah. Um, how important was it to – it can be a sensitive area when you're talking yeah. about people with disabilities and – and all the rest. I mean, we had a thing here in Ireland this week where um, some celebrities decided to use wheelchairs for 24 hours to try and raise awareness for people who who have to use wheelchairs. And you can imagine what the what the reaction was to something like that. So, how important was it for you to to talk to people with the disabilities? Yeah. So they can tell their stories rather than somebody co-opting their experience and saying, yeah. well, this is terrible. This is this is really inconvenient to me. You know, yeah. but it, this is someone's life. So it, it must have been, I'm not going to say difficult, but but one of the things you had to, to do was make sure that it's those people who are telling those stories. Yeah, you can't be, I learned. I learned by my mistakes and, and the, the people I was interviewing allowed me to make mistakes because they were pleased mm. I was doing what I was doing. So for example, a, a simple thing like it's terminology, like uh, you might say someone's wheelchair bound. They hate that. The, the wheelchair users want to be called wheelchair users. Mm. So I, I didn't know that. I now know that, you know, so there are things that you, you say that you shouldn't say and, and you learn and, and people were empathetic with that because I was trying to do something that they thought was worthwhile. But there are, I mean, certainly I, I can't do it yet because we haven't really been fully back, but I, all these interviews were done either via email, WhatsApp for the deaf, uh, you know, people in who are interviewed or, or, or via Zoom, you know. Um, mm. So I didn't actually meet and, and I've not met any of these individuals face to face. And I want to, obviously it's now, now we're back. So I want to go to the sensory room, you know, Arsenal, I've been invited to spend, you know, a pre-match in the sensory room or a match, I want to go and sit as the partner of, of, of some of the blind fans I've interviewed because they want me to. They want me to experience it as they experience it. And there was a guy I did an interview with Alan Marbert. Alan Marbert's uh, the second chapter. He's on the uh, he's on the committee of the Arsenal Disabled Sports mm. Association. Lovely guy. Been going since the 70s and uh, was actually an Olympic 400-metre uh, runner, a blind runner. But he... Uh, He's had a journalist go with him and, and do the whole blindfold experience and everything. And, and he wants me to do that. So, he, you know, it's not me asking to do that. He wants me to do that. So I, I do think I've still got more to learn and I will continue the journey. Mm. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to stop being interested just because I've finished the book. I, I, I'm actually very interested in learning more yeah. um, and experiencing it in the way they experience it. So tell us, when is when is it coming out and how can people get a hold of it? I know you can pre-order right now. So are there details? Yeah. Well, the thing is that we're waiting because the club themselves wanted to get involved. And that's an interesting point. It was called Gunning Through Adversity. Mm. You know, the club are, the club have given us permission, obviously, to, to, to tie it in with their mantra, which is amazing. And the back cover will say, has the club logo supported by Arsenal? The, the club shop, the armoury will be stocking, you know, mm. uh, hundreds. So we're just waiting to find out on Wednesday. I, I, I can't tell you for definite, but I would say 95% certain there's going to be a launch event um, in the armoury. It's currently planned to be on the morning of the 27th of November before the Newcastle game, because that is the closest home game to International Disability Day, which is the 3rd of December. And then there will be the usual customary Tollington event at the home game afterwards, which I think is West Ham, when I'm told, and you can inform me as well, that but by Martin says all the Irish fans come over with lots of money for the last game for Christmas. So it's like that. Everyone, <laughs> <laughs> everyone's coming home from Ireland. So yeah, there'll be a couple of events there, but at the moment, yeah, you can pre-order it um, from the legends website and it's obviously all over my Twitter. And I'm sure you can. Yeah. We'll, we'll link now. Absolutely. Um, if people want to just check the, uh, the post on Irish blog or they want to check the show notes right now in their app, you'll find a link through to. They're also, to the um, so the club shop will be stuck in it. Obviously you'll be able to get it by the Arsenal direct, mm. but, also, I've arranged for, which is important, now we've got the final PDF that's going off tomorrow to the Royal National Institute for the Blind, who will be producing it as an audio book for downloading from their library. So any partially sighted fans or Ryan fans that want to read the book, or listen to the book, sorry, can do so. Um, that will be free service from the RNIB as well. Excellent. Well, look, I wish you uh, all the very best with it. And it's, uh, you know, it's great to get a different perspective on things, even if life some uh, sometimes... Uh, pushes us in that direction in unfortunate ways. And I'm very and they're sorry. They're inspiring people. You know, the yeah. stories, each individual chapter is a fascinating, inspiring, motivational story in sure. its own right, you know, sure. without well, my writing from just because of what the individuals have talked about. You know, so. Yeah. All right. Well, look, while you're here, we might as well just talk a couple of minutes about 
Arsenal and what's going on this season. And, you know, with your with your uh, fresh eyes on things, how are you viewing this particular season so far? A bit up and down, obviously, but are you encouraged, discouraged? Is it is it is it hard to make your mind up yet about what's yeah. going on? Yeah, uh, I'm. Again, yeah, it, it is a context thing. And I, you know, I, I'm probably a more patient fan than I used to be. I, I like Arteta to succeed. I, I, I've I've had doubts about, um, as we all have, about his stubbornness, you know, the, the Wenger trait that's there and, and, and his intransigence. But I think that's starting to change. We've seen a bit more fluidity of changing formation in game. So I'm encouraged by that. You know, moving from 4 2 3 1 to 4 3 3 in game. And I think without Shaka, we're going to see a lot more of that. I'm very pleased, as I'm sure we all are, with most of the purchases. I mean, you know, I was always in favour of Ramsdale, and I can say that hand on heart. I couldn't really understand the the the, sort of the, the angst about it. Of course, that angst has rapidly disappeared, which I'm pleased to see. He's he's definitely a, a, a great addition. I think Tommy Asu, I see, had three games in quick succession or four. He looked a bit tired against Brighton, so that hopefully mm. the break and getting used to the Premier League. But no, I'm massively encouraged. You know, it. Uh, We've got we've got a run of winnable games. You know, Brighton was a game playing averagely that we would have lost in previous seasons, and we didn't. We looked defensively solid. So uh, White and Gabriel seem to be developing understanding. So yeah, a lot of positive signs. I mean, we can't get carried away, but I'm certainly more positive than not. Okay, well, look, let's hope we can keep up this momentum after the international break again. Thanks very much indeed for for taking the time, Dave. Good luck with no, the book, thank you. and um, yeah, we'll, we'll chat soon. Cheers, mate. Take care. You can find Dave on Twitter at GoonerDave66, at GoonerDave66. And like I said, in the show notes, you'll find a link to the book for more information on how you can order, etc., etc. It's also on the post on arsblog.com as well. And thank you very much indeed to Dave. I look forward to reading the book when it's all printed and ready. So that's really just about that. There is no game to look forward to this weekend. James and I, of course, will be here on Monday with an Arscast Extra. There might be a bit of Arsenal news. There might not, but there will definitely be a podcast. So please do join us for that. If you want a bit more, there's a new episode of Statements, the podcast in which I have a guest that has to either strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree with statements that are provided by our wonderful Patreon members. Uh, My guest for this one was James, uh, so there was no chance of him saying, I don't know, to that. You can find it right now at patreon.com forward slash arsblog. For now, though, let's leave it there. Have yourselves a great weekend, and we will catch you on the next one. Until then, cheers. Bye-bye. Oh, man, I really wish we had a new owner for our football club. I hate the ones we've got right now. A bunch of pricks. Well, hello. Who the fuck are you? I'm here to make all your club ownership dreams come true. We have the perfect candidate just for you. Perfect, eh? Is he rich? He is a billionaire many, many times over. And is he willing to spend some fucking money? Think of a number. He'll spend twice as much as that without batting an eyelid. And what about buying players? Will he buy players? What else is he going to spend the fucking money on? That's a fair point. All right, so he's rich? Yes. And he'll spend some fucking money? You bet. And he'll buy players? Uh Uh-huh. All sounds a bit too good to be true. It's got to be a catch. What's a catch? He does not like puppies. Well, I mean, that's all right. Not everyone can like dogs, I guess. Unless they're stir-fried with ginger and garlic. What? He's also a collector. Well, lots of lots of people collect things. Of human feet. Well, I suppose, uh, you know, once they're, once they were dead before the feet were taken... Feet removed from people while they're still alive. That sounds... that sounds bad, actually. His favourite song is... 
Sweet Caroline. Oh, for fuck's sake. And finally, he also has a doomsday device placed at the center of the Earth which will bring about the destruction of the entire human race. Right, well, I have to say, it's given me some pause for thought, but he is rich. Yes. And he will spend some fucking money. You bet. And he will buy players. Oh, well then, oh, I'm in. I mean, if you can't fucking beat them, join them. Join them in hell. <laughs> what did you say? Sorry, I didn't catch that. I was busy phoning me, mate, telling him we're going to buy Messi. <laughs>